I'm Ryan. I'm an ITYF at JAXA at uh, the Institute of Space and Astronautical Science in Sagamihara, Japan. Um, so it's kind of a exciting place to be right now. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about our Wolf Ray Star uh, program for the early release science. Um, so it's a program to resolve the nature of dust in Wolf Ray winds. Uh, so this is a project that um, I'm doing in collaboration um, with a bunch of folks around the world. So some of the co-eyes are Matt Hankins, uh, Anand Siramakrishnan, Dipashri Thot, uh, Joel Sanchez Bermudez, Asher Lamberts, and uh, Christopher Russell, and of course uh, the rest of the Dusters team. Oh, let's see. Yeah, okay, so I'll get started with the talk outline. Um, first, I'll go through a quick background on what exactly a Wolf Ray star is and how they can form dust and sort of just go through the, the main motivation into our uh, science. Uh, then I'll talk about our science focus, which is um, kind of an interesting thing. So we're trying to revisit the dust input uh, and the impact of Wolf Ray stars on galactic dust budgets. Um, so these are kind of overlooked sources uh, in this context. Uh, and then I'll focus more on the details of our early release science program, so some of the observing modes uh, and the technical details of the program. Okay, so let's get started. Um, Wolf Ray stars and how they formed us. All right, so this is a Wolf Ray star. Uh, these are descendants of massive O stars, uh, the post-main sequence phase of these uh, massive stars. So we're pretty much looking at the exposed uh, helium core after episodes of uh, uh, mass loss. So wolf ray stars are characterized by very high luminosities, uh, greater than 10 to the 5 solar luminosities, uh, very hot effective temperatures, strong winds, and also uh, extremely high mass loss rates. Um, so when you look at all of these characteristics, uh, you wouldn't necessarily think that uh, these types of stars are very good uh, dust formers, but some of them actually are, which is quite surprising. And the key to the dust formation in these Wolf Ray stars seems to be the presence of a binary companion that's driving its own winds, um, so an O or a B star companion, that actually compresses the winds from the Wolf Ray star into this dense shock cone. So the material actually compresses, uh, it flows downstream from the apex of the shock cone, and then it reaches the right temperatures and the right densities where you can actually get dust formation despite um, how hot and luminous both of these stars are. So we're looking at a massive binary system. Uh, these two stars aren't just staying stationary. They're actually, I mean, they're orbiting around each other on very short time scales. And so you can actually trace out the orbital motion of the system based on the morphology of the dust. Since the dust is uh, forming behind the O star, um, you, the, the, the flow or the, the morphology of the dust um, can actually be used to um, study the orbital parameters. So this is just an artist's rendition of uh, the dust formation in this type of system. Uh, but these are the actual observations. Uh, this is uh, Keck observations done by Peter Tuthill uh, that show the famous Wolf Ray uh, 104 um, dust producing Wolf Ray system. And so you're actually looking at um, the dust that's forming behind the, I think it's a B star in this system, um, over its 220 day orbital period. Um, so this is dust that's continuously forming, uh, that's radially expanding behind the O star and you're seeing it expand uh, outwards, which kind of looks like a spinning uh, pinwheel, but the actual motion of the dust is uh, in the radial direction. All right, so this is a pretty nice picture, um, but why are these uh, astrophysically interesting objects? Um, so I'm interested in studying them as potential sources of dust um, in the early and local universe. Um, it has a lot of the really um, good characteristics for a solid dust former. Uh, these are descendants of massive stars, which means they evolve on fairly rapid timescales on millions of years. And they're also very efficient dust formers. Um, so they're uh, kind of like the right time to start to revisit their, uh, their impact as uh, dust formers. One way to put these systems into context is to look at the known dust-producing sources 
uh, in well-studied environments uh, like the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, so in this slide, I'll sort of highlight the different populations of really um, well-known or, or leading uh, dust-producing sources, and also highlight um, the problem that we have uh, or why exactly we need uh, another dust source here. So um, these are kind of just approximate numbers from these uh, publications uh, that I'm showing here. Um, for AGB stars, uh, so this is their total dust production rates, red supergiants, and uh, core collapse supernovae. So the core, core collapse supernovae uh, appear to lead the total dust production rates of all of these three. But the problem is um, they drive very uh, strong shocks into the surrounding interstellar uh, environment. So they're sweeping up a bunch of dust and destroying it. Um, not only that, but they also drive strong reverse shocks back into the material that they form, back into the dust that forms in their ejecta. So you're also dealing with that as a, um, as a, as a dust destruction mechanism. So when you factor in the destruction rates from core collapse supernovae, it actually starts to uh, overwhelm the dust production rate from all these other sources combined um, by over an order of magnitude. So this is what's really um, driving the motivation to search for additional dust uh, input sources. Uh, so if we look at what a wolf ray star binary does, um, so that we've found that it actually exhibits a range of dust production rates. But the point that I want to make is that for the most um, productive system uh, that's producing 10 to the minus 5 solar masses of dust a year, that's the same amount of dust that's being produced by the entire population of AGB stars in the LMC. So just a single uh, binary pair of wolf ray stars, of dust producing wolf ray stars, um, can be a substantial dust producer. And that's kind of the, uh, the main points of this slide. So the implications are that these should be important sources uh, of dust. But of course, uh, there is much bigger uh, questions and implications uh, about this. So, for example, uh, we know that uh, these are carbon rich wolf ray stars that appear to be forming dust, but we don't really know what the molecular precursors are of this carbon dust. Um, so, it's difficult to interpret what the uh, chemical formation pathways are of these dust, dust grains. Uh, so I gave a qualitative picture of how dust forms in uh, wolf ray binaries, uh, but we don't actually fully understand uh, the dust formation physics in this kind of environment, in the shock cone and this cooling along the, the shock cone. And another important question, um, so I mentioned that wolf ray stars have very strong winds, uh, or very fast winds, so dust is forming in these thousands of kilometer a second flows, it needs to interact and decelerate into the ISM um, in order to be incorporated into it. So uh, it does how much of this dust actually survives um, as it goes through that process? So these are some of our uh, big outstanding questions. And that's what leads us to our early release science case uh, to study the nature of dust formation uh, in these wolf ray winds. All right, so um, I'm pretty happy working with uh, this solid team of international researchers. Uh, there's about 40 of us, uh, massive star, dust, uh, infrared astronomers, uh, experts um, from, yeah, from all, all, all around the world. So pretty exciting and solid team. And I already kind of mentioned our science goals, but just to summarize it in this little animation here, uh, we're really interested in the molecular composition of the precursors for the carbon-rich dust in wolf ray stars. So um, can we see evidence of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, hydrogen amorphous carbons, quenched carbonaceous composites? There should be something there uh, that we can detect um, or, or evidence of these uh, molecules that are there that form the carbon-rich dust that we see in these winds. And then also to study the dust evolution, so how it grows and how it um, gets uh, destroyed or processed uh, as it starts interacting with the surrounding ISM.
All right, and this is our target. It's WR140, so we have one target, uh, and this is kind of the ideal target for James Webb uh, based on the, the spatial resolution of this and also um, the sensitivity. So this system is uh, a little bit different from uh, the one that I showed you, the pinwheel system. So this is actually a little more, actually a lot more eccentric. Uh, the eccentricity is about 0.9, and it has an orbital period of about eight years. So instead of forming dust continuously, uh, this system actually forms dust um, episodically. So every time the Wolf Ray Star and the O Star Companion go through Periastron Passage, the point of closest approach, uh, it undergoes this dust formation episode. So in this image here, uh, you actually see the dust, the spatially resolved dust uh, that's formed uh, after this Periastron Passage. So I'm going to show a series of observations uh, that show the expansion of this dust plume here. So this is about a year later. Uh, and then you can see the dust uh, starting to expand. And it expands very uh, rapidly, too. So as I mentioned, these are in very fast winds. So this dust is expanding on the order of 2, 000, over 2,000 kilometers a second. Um, so you'll see it expand on pretty relatively short time scales. And then this is a little bit later, and then a little bit later. So you can actually see these uh, features uh, and, and kind of trace them along the, uh, the different time scales of the dust as it's uh, bending outwards. OK, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit and change wavelengths. So now we're looking at a Michelle image. So this is a 12.5 micron uh, thermal infrared image taken from Gemini. And there's a kind of two interesting things to point out. So you see a very bright central point source. That's not coming from dust. That's uh, free free emission from the Wolf Ray winds. And it's quite bright, and it'll contaminate um, any kind of low resolution observation, low uh, spatial resolution observation of the system. So we really need the high uh, spatial resolution. Uh, the second thing to point out is that um, beyond, we see this is the first dust arc here. And then beyond this, uh, at about two arc seconds away, uh, we see the secondary dust arc uh, here. Um, so we can study past dust formation events, also study common features uh, along this uh, dust arc. And so with James Webb, uh, when we look at this, with the sensitivity of James Webb, we can uh, pick up at least eight of these. Okay, so we have a 15.2 hour program. Uh, we're using the MIRI imager, the MIRI IFU, and also the aperture masking interferometry mode on the nearest instrument. Um, so I'm not gonna go into, I'm not gonna talk to, to in uh, very great detail about our observing modes, but I'll just leave this slide up here um, for you guys to reference later uh, if you're reviewing this presentation. But um, just to highlight, the observing modes that we're using. So the MIRI imager, uh, we're using the full uh, imager field of view to get uh, 74 by 114 arc seconds uh, with 15, 21, and 25 microns to detect at least eight past dust formation episodes. And so with the uh, multiple filter combinations, we can determine dust temperatures and then importantly, uh, derive dust masses. Uh, and then we can study that as, uh, as we go outwards and count the different um, dust arcs. So one of the observations that I'm really excited about is the IFU observations. So getting this spatially resolved spectroscopy of the dust around this bright central uh, system uh, and to search for these uh, molecules or, or these chemical signatures of uh, the Wolf Ray dust and to do that for the first time. Um, so I think that's going to be one of the highlights of our um, science highlights of our program. And um, we're also going to be using uh, the aperture masking interferometry mode with NEARIS to obtain this really high contrast, um, high spatial resolution observations of the inner uh, parts or the inner field of view of the dust uh, to resolve the morphology. Um, so to kind of interpret how the dust has formed in this complicated uh, shock cone 
uh, geometry uh, as the two stars went through periastron passage. And so what's kind of nice is there's this natural synergy between Neris, which probes the hotter dust at finer spatial scales, uh, while Miri probes the warmer or the warm extended dust. Um, so that's one thing that I uh, really like about our program is that we have this uh, one target and both the instruments that we're using and the observing modes on it um, are kind of well suited for um, the science that we're interested in uh, or, uh, in, our, in our program. And we also have uh, some, uh, some technical goals, of course, as an ERS program. So we figure a lot of people will want to look at um, bright sources with interesting diffuse uh, emission around it, so like AGN tori, protoplanetary disks, and also other uh, massive stars with uh, ejecta around it. So one of the main questions we want to answer is how well uh, James Webb can detect this faint extended emission um, around bright central point sources. And this involves dealing with bright source artifacts that plague mid-infrared detectors, both space and ground-based. Um, so there's effects like persistence um, scattering along the rows and columns and this kind of column pull-up and pull-down effect that I'll show uh, in the next slide. And then, so we want to really address how close to a bright source uh, can we detect faint extended emission and how well can we detect it. So utilizing these bright source correction techniques that we can adopt from uh, Sophia or Spitzer, and to apply that to the James Webb data, and also utilize uh, PSF subtraction. So we're also looking at uh, PSF reference stars uh, to try to use this technique. And this is just an example of one of the techniques that we were testing. Uh, so with the forecast instrument, the mid-infrared camera on, on Sophia, uh, we have this technique that we call channel subtraction, which is essentially uh, a median filter along the detector channels. Uh, but we applied it to some test data from JPL, MIRI test data from JPL. Uh, and you can see that the correction effect that it has on these really nasty artifacts, um, this is a line cut plot through these two lines you see here. And the blue line is after uh, running this artifact correction routine. So it does a pretty good job, at least uh, cosmetically, at correcting some of these, these nasty bright artifacts. Okay, um, so I'll just end with a summary. Uh, so these wolf ray star systems are interesting. They should be an important source of dust, but of course there's lots of questions remaining. Uh, we're, uh, and this is why we're um, doing this uh, early release science program uh, with James Webb to look at uh, the dust composition growth and destruction uh, of our target WR140. And we're also doing lots of uh, interesting ongoing work uh, with ground-based observatories like Subaru, so doing this kind of galactic uh, survey of, uh, of uh, the known wolf ray stars. So with that, um, I want to thank you guys for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Ryan, for that very informative talk. Um, are there any questions from people who are online? You do have it. You're just on mute. I've muted people as they came on. All right. Well, I have one, Ryan. Um, so you're looking at bright stars um, with and the faint the faint dust around them, uh, but these stars are really blue. So are they really going to be like super bright? Are they going to saturate um, the arrays like you're predicting with the columns and rows and stuff? Or yeah, so they're probably not going to get this nasty, um, but um, at certain uh, emission lines like neon two. Since we're using the IFU mode, it might get pretty bad. Um, the massive stars are pretty blue, but um, they actually exhibit a pretty strong uh, near to mid infrared excess because of the free free emission. And that's what that's what's going to the emission here, uh, WR140. Okay. So yeah, we do expect to see a pretty strong uh, centralized um, point source. And so for the things that you're going to be delivering to the community, you're going to be coming up with tools or methodologies to remove these bright artifacts from things and yeah, producing yeah, yeah. a so clean product. Is that what you're pr producing for the community? Yep, yep, exactly. So it's, it's uh, adapting these different 
um, right source uh, artifact mitigation techniques uh, from these different uh, infrared uh, platforms and then, uh, yeah, adapting it for use on uh, MIRI and also for uh, NIR. So will you be creating like Python tools, you think? Yeah, or that's what I, yeah, okay. that's what I anticipate, yeah. Okay, well, very good. Um, any other questions for Ryan? Right, and if not, um, let's thank you, Ryan, and uh, we're gonna move on.